Wszystko zaczęło się od króla Jagiełły. Mała Łodzia stała się miastem, które w XIX wieku rozwijało się najszybciej na świecie. W ciągu zaledwie 60 lat od powstania pierwszej manufaktury powstaje przemysłowa, wielonarodowościowa metropolia. Jednak wiatry historii nie zawsze jej sprzyjały. To, co zniszczył los, odbudowują łodzianie. Nasza Łódź. Miasto wielkich szans. Od 600 lat w sercu Polski i Europy. Jesteśmy Polakami. Jesteśmy niezwykłym społeczeństwem. Zawsze w obliczu wielkiego wyzwania potrafimy się mobilizować. Potrafimy stawić czoła wielkim wyzwaniom. Bo nie potrafimy stać obojętnie. Bo obchodzi nas bezpieczeństwo i przyszłość naszych dzieci. Bo wierzymy, że nadzieja zwycięża apatię, lęk i strach. Bo mimo wszelkich przeciwności nigdy się nie poddajemy. Potrafimy ciężko pracować, wspierać się i działać razem. Bo zależy nam na naszej ojczyźnie, naszym osiedlu, naszej ulicy. Bo chcemy naszych niezbywalnych praw i wolności. Bo nie oddamy naszych marzeń. Nadchodzi punkt zwrotny. Good morning, everybody. I suppose there are people here. We are very much blinded by uh, the light here. So, but I suppose you're here. So good morning, everyone, uh, uh, to this session on economic education in an age of populism. And uh, first I introduce myself. My name is Detmar Döring from the Friedrich Naumann Foundation office in uh, Prague. Friedrich Naumann Foundation, uh, is a German civic in, uh, education institution uh, that promotes liberal values, freedom, rule of law, human rights, free markets uh, around the globe and is a long-standing partner of Freedom Games. With Freedom Games, uh, I've come to the topic of freedom. If you look at all indicators, uh, indices, about freedom worldwide, Freedom House, uh, Human uh, Freedom Index or so, you will find last year's freedom has been in decline in recess for a considerable time now. Same is true with economic freedoms. Uh, whether on the left or right, it seems that some interventionist, protectionist policies on the march uh, forward everywhere. And the corona crisis did its... Uh, had an effect too on, on this. And uh, we also have to is observe, and maybe, and that's what we will discuss here, this somehow connects with it, state of economic education in our education in our school system. Uh, in many countries, it has been replaced by other political subjects and uh, Even our Minister of Finances in Germany recently said that we need more financial and economic education because people don't know what they're doing here. They may act uh, in a way that with good intentions but don't see the consequences uh, of it if you don't have any economic theoretical uh, background. So uh, we have a wonderful panel here. Uh, I think I will introduce them just in one sentence or so, uh, from left to right. There's Adam Barta, he's director of Epicenter uh, Network, it's a, the think tank network for Europe based in Brussels. So he comes in contact with oodles of people who are the best experts and they do educational matters themselves. Uh, we have Aneta Vein, the vice president of the Lithuanian uh, Free Market Institute, which is, to my knowledge, one of the most active think tanks in this field. Uh, when economics is taught in 
Lithuanian schools, it's usually based on something she has written or one of her colleagues has written. Uh, there's Marcin Duma, executive director of IBRIS. It's a Polish think tank. Uh, well, primarily it begins with market research. They're doing this and they finance it as a foundation. I have just learned a consultation somehow for uh, social policy uh, reforms. And they are, I would also, since recently, uh, very active in the field of education, teaching teachers, etc., in uh, 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 Poland. We have Tom Palmer here, who is uh, vice, executive vice president for international programs of the Atlas Foundation. Everybody knows what the Atlas Foundation is, who is active in the world of think tanks, liberal and free market think tanks. And he is, so to say, heart of soul of the whole uh, thing. And, uh, well, we have some of the name Bata is overrepresented in <laughs> <laughs> But this is a Hungarian spelling with T-H. And uh, this is Matej uh, Bata, just with the T, Slovak version, because he's an analyst at Ines, uh, uh, Slovak uh, 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 economic think tank. and. Uh, they are organizers of the Economic Olympiad uh, school contest uh, all over the country, an idea that has spread around in Europe uh, recently quite a lot. So, I outlined at the beginning, we see a decline of personal democratic and economic uh, freedoms, and uh, also the state of economic education among people uh, could be better, to put it mildly. Uh, but should we matter? Why is knowledge on economics so important for a free society? And that's, I think we all agree that we fight for a free society. Or should other be, subjects be in the focus? I mean, there are, when you learn politics, it could be climate change and dis anti-discrimination, which is also popular. But why economics? I think I again begin from left Adam Bata, what do you think? Sure. Just somehow three minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to be even shorter, I promise. Um, education is always a topic where we think it's super important because of the long term, right? But there are so many short term challenges that it often doesn't come to the forefront. So I'm very happy that this discussion is taking place. And you asked whether you know, economics should be taught or should be taught at the expense of other subjects. Um, I don't necessarily think it's at the expense of other subjects because economics is part of everything. Um, if we actually set up the school curriculum correctly, then we're going to see that economics is part of history, economics is part of biology, you mentioned environmental challenges and climate change, for example. Um, I think if students would be much better aware of some of the basic theoretical concepts of economic ideas, like trade-offs, like the price mechanisms and the rest, then we could have a much better and much more intelligent conversation about a lot of the challenges uh, that we regard as contemporary. So just to give you an example, well, when history is taught in Central European schools, it's always about you know how big statesmen are acting, what are the wars that we are fighting, and there is very, very little discussion about kind of the economic progress that we had made over time. There is very little discussion about the role of entrepreneurs, the role of ideas, the role of innovation when it comes to history. So I think rather than hoping that we're going to teach economics, you know, five hours a week for youngsters, I think we can ensure that a lot of the subjects that are already taught in high schools and primary schools have some uh, angle that links to economic ideas. Interesting approach, but very ambitious one if you think about it. You have to teach not only the economics teachers, but uh, the history teachers as well. Okay, but uh, somebody who has really tried it, Aneta. Yes, we have an economics textbook in schools. It covers 80% of our high school youth. So basically, all kids learn economics from our textbook, but we came to the understanding over the course of time, just to second Adam, that um, if we just teach economics as a separate subject, which we do, um, it's just half, half of the story. And 
it's interesting that you mentioned perhaps, well, climate change is a more interesting topic or more relevant topic today. But, you know, the genuine Green Deal starts when we go, go to the grocery store and we have full shelves in front of our eyes to exercise our freedom uh, and to choose and send signals um, uh, to, the, um, to the producers. So, um, just let me, on, on this, on this um, interrelation, interplay of different things, as Adam said, just let me give you this. Half of all Europeans um, support the idea of universal, unconditional basic income to all, with no strings attached, for nothing. Uh, in Central Eastern Europe, um, the support for this idea is even higher among uh, youth, among people aged 11 to uh, 15 to 34. And most people find it a great idea, you know, that you have this economic safety, independence, as they say, to say no to jobs, to say no to wage slavery, to don't have to work out of necessity and to engage in, you know, truly fulfilling and, and voluntary work. And if we know economics, if we understand economics, we really understand that's disastrous, right? That's disastrous in many ways. Poland, I think, last year announced an experiment on universal and conditional basic income in Gminy Warmińsko Mazurskie. So they, they're going to give 1,300 zlotys um, for some cohort of people per month for nothing for two years in a row to give economic safety and to see what becomes of those people and what becomes of us if we don't have any ties, don't do things because we serve others and create well-being. So I think um, the, the, every step we take, we weigh, uh, we compare, uh, we um, make trade-offs and it's not just when we buy things, right? It's, um, it's everything we do. So basically economic action underlies, underpins everything. So that's why this approach uh, to economics, when we understand in broader terms that we make trade-offs and we make trade-offs in time because we are limited, we are mortal human beings. And I think this understanding of economics, that it underpins every action, every choice we make is key. And that's why it's everywhere, as you say. And um, we should promote this, this kind of understanding of economics. It's our trade-off, every step we take, because we are mortal and limited in time. And thankfully. Your turn, please. I think that uh, regarding the economical education, we have both problems on input and output. Um, <clears throat> let's start from the output. Uh, we observe that the populist parties, the populist uh, political movements, well, they are rising and they are getting more and more strength in, in terms of a political market. And we observe that in Poland too. Is it a lacking of knowledge on the basis of economy? Well, we have uh, in our schools, same like in Lithuania, uh, we are teaching them economics. It is not the economics, uh, um, uh, I mean, like on the universities. These, uh, this, um, these lessons are called entrepreneurship uh, lessons, and uh, the pupils are given all needed knowledge in terms of prices, inflation, and uh, the market mechanisms, and. Uh, we operated SARV and we have confirmed that they understand that, they know how it works, and still they are more eager to vote on far right or far left populisms than party more liberal or in the center. Um, why is that? It is a problem of input, I mentioned. Um, what is the problem with the input? Okay, they got some knowledge, some instruments in the school, but, and yet the main source of their economic knowledge is not school. It is the internet. The TikTok is more popular 
than a school lessons as a source of economic knowledge. Uh, the YouTube is same popular uh, as a TikTok. So they are shaping their views, not in school, not at home. Uh, at home, they are not shaping at all their, uh, their approach towards uh, economy and it, its mechanisms. They are doing this on their own in the internet, and this is a problem of input. And the problem of output, you've mentioned that. Thank you. So that's even a more uh, enormous task to change the input <laughs> and change the contents of uh, TikTok. Now, let's see. Uh, Tom. There we go. Um, let me address it directly politically, as the last one did. Uh, first of all, I'm a little skeptical about most classroom experience. We also find classes on identifying disinformation at American universities when they test the students with fake news stories versus ones from real newspapers. Uh, at the beginning, at the end, it turns out at the end, they score worse. So this is very depressing. Uh, these classes are not working. And so I'm all in favor of having classes on economics. They have some positive benefit. But remember, it's in a wider embedded context of TikTok and uh, it's not Twitter, X uh, and so on. So let's look at what populism is. It's a general approach to politics that posits a, an enemy, often a hidden enemy, and it's based on magic. Our leaders, our Gandalf, the wizard, or whatever, will chant magical spells and attack and destroy the enemy. We have a scientific approach, and it's a little difficult in the narrative to fight magic with science, because magic is cooler, more interesting, and easier to accept into your life. So we have to talk about trade-offs, and that I mentioned this, I think it's extremely important. You can talk to people and say, well, if you get more of this, what if you get less of that? And that, I think, helps to undermine the whole populist discourse. It's not all magic. Maybe there are trade-offs. There's cause and effect. And then the other element is to talk about incentives. And most people grasp it. Change incentives, you change behavior. How do you change incentives? By changing the rules. And that brings us into discussion of rule-based order rather than magic. So I think this can be done in popular discourse. It can be done even on TikTok uh, to talk about things like trade-offs. Uh, and then finally, what's the real cost of all these populist programs? It's very difficult for, for us to grasp billions and billions of euros. It's too big. What we can do is understand percentages. So Tax Freedom Day, I think, is one of the most powerful methods against this runaway statism. You calculate it. What is the day that the average person in your country stops working for the state and begins working for herself or himself? Find that day, work with accountants, and then on that day all across the country have people handing out Zwati notes. Be very careful you don't get in trouble with uh, counterfeiting. But instead of saying 100 Zwatis, it says 40 Zwatis which is to say that's what you're really getting from your 100 Zwatis after all the taxes are collected. And I've seen in a number of countries these are very powerful means to focus attention on what are the real burdens that we bear, most of which are hidden. So I think in public education there are a lot of techniques that we should use that have been used very effectively in a number of countries and they need to be deployed outside of the classroom as well as inside. So, uh, next speaker. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I just maybe want to add um, something on top of what Tom said. Um, and it is true that at the heart of populism, there is a divide between us, the good guys, and someone else who is corrupt, who is doing bad things to us. And I personally think that at the heart of liberal economics, there is cooperation, right? Through this liberal, uh, through this liberal economic education, we can really understand the benefits of what happens when we try to cooperate peacefully and productively with as many people um, as possible. So I truly think that 
nowadays um, we have very different kinds of, of populism um, but at the heart of each of it uh, of yeah at the heart of each pop of each kind of populism is this divide which can be tackled if we really understand um, yeah the the heart of uh, of economic cooperation um, and this then spills over not just into the economy, but also in the society more broadly. Um, I come from a country that is post-communist. Um, there is not a big tradition of uh, very liberal uh, uh, economic behavior or education. And you can really see that people very easily believe all, uh, all these populist pr uh, promises. And Again, there are two dimensions. One of them is that um, people don't really think about what the protectionist measures mean um, and what they will cause. But also, the society is extremely polarized um, and people don't really grasp, grasp what they could get out of a coherent civic society that cooperates um, yeah, uh, inside of it. So uh, see, economics could be almost some kind of peacemaking process, uh, encouraging uh, uh, cooperation. Now, if I could sum up this first round, I would say, yes, everybody thinks that economic education, good economic education is absolutely important. Uh, it's a vital interest of every uh, good society, but uh, whether our educational system uh, can do it or can they just integrate it in other subjects or uh, things outside uh, uh, the educational system which might, might, might sometimes may even be counterproductive in its effect uh, do better so uh, the question is now if I would sum up if I would look at schools all around the globe I would say I would ask questions have schools somehow really failed can they teach economics properly at all or uh, do they sometimes not only amplify uh, the agendas we don't want to see uh, agendas on the left and right I mean uh, my wife uh, for a long time when we were still in Berlin uh, was at the parents uh, council for uh, school administrations administration and she always had to do with the curricula what, they, what actually is taught at uh, uh, schools. I mean, we have been probably even then too idealistic, at least when it comes to Berlin. Okay, okay, that's usually not a really benchmark. Uh, uh, Berlin, so uh, question is, uh, can this be done? Can we really succeed? I mean, we see some examples, uh, Lithuania, but I think that might be an exception or so. Um, Matt, I already touched on the role of polarization, so I want to link link it to it and challenge Tom a little bit when it comes to you know the importance of this traditional type of education. Because you're right, I think lectures can be very boring, and you know people are not super engaged. But if people spend 12 years of their lives, and even just 10% of it rubs on to students, and it's something that we dislike, I think it still very, very much matters. And the problem is that nowadays in most Western liberal democracies, uh, we have a very polarized society, right? So when it comes to school boards and teachers and parents trying to agree on a curriculum, if it's not the state that says it, um, people are going to have very, very diverging views, right? Um, and I think us classical liberals and libertarians often make the mistake that we want to essentially take over institutions and say that, okay, it's the right type of education that we want to enable our students to have and, you know, get all the bad leftist ideas out of our institutions. I think this is very much a conversation that's happening in the UK and the United States at the moment, and it's very much spreading all across uh, liberal democracies. I would say that that's the wrong way to go about it. I think we have to accept value pluralism and essentially foster an environment where very different ideas, sometimes totally opposing ideas, can be presented to students in a reasonably uh, objective manner. So what am I talking about? I think in English-speaking countries, you have a lot of debate culture going on. 
right? So if we try to reform schools and encourage school boards to essentially say that, okay, you're very welcome to invite a speaker that believes in you know, high redistribution and socialist policies. But on the other hand, we are very happy to provide you with a speaker that's going to explain the benefits of market economics to you. I think most teachers would be reasonably open to these ideas, right? And then students are essentially presented with multiple options. It's not a complete free market libertarian takeover of the educational system. But it's also not a totally just left ideological um, presentation of the words that students receive. How to do that? I think that's a bit more tricky. Um, I think there are some countries that have a reasonably pluralistic educational system. Um, if you look at Sweden, besides uh, Lithuania, you know, Lithuanians went the other way. It's kind of the state setting uh, the curriculum. Uh, whereas in, in Sweden, um, it's very much a voucher system. So people. Uh, parents are able to choose the schools, uh, the type of schools that their t children um, can study in, whether it's run by private corporations, whether it's run by the municipal government or churches. I think you're going to have a much more pluralistic society with uh, you know, fostering different type of ideas than in a French type of system where the state really says that this is the curriculum and on that day all the students in the country ought to be studying X. So if libertarians and classical liberals are pushing for a more pluralistic rather than <coughs> state-run educational system, I think that's one way to go about it. So it would be a good argument for autonomy of schools. Uh, and uh, parents' rights uh, in this context. Difficult uh, to realize in some countries, I suppose, but where it, it's, it seems it could be effective. So, uh, yes, Lithuania does it better, yes, we know. <laughs> yeah, but now I will challenge you, Adam. <laughs> and um, I think the problem is precisely because we ideologize economics. And um, we have to de-ideologize because we have to talk about the origins of economic institutions that make, up, make humanity uh, capable of sustaining itself. You know, the thing is that we, it's not like the, the order we um, want to preserve. You know, it's, it's not something designed by some mega mind right, or subplotted by some group of people, uh, or, you know, uh, sustained by some interests. The institutions that underlie econo economic action in our economies, they are humanity's natural response to the, to the givens of our existence, which are lack, scarcity, time, and those institutions that we want people to appreciate and embrace and acknowledge and preserve in order to preserve basically humankind, <laughs> the institutions of property, exchange, profit, um, money, they evolved as our natural response in the course of time, over the course of human history, uh, as our natural response, they, they got you know repeated, spread, and they transformed into, into institutions. And that's, you know, you can rewrite economics to the left, to the right, but economics is economics. It's just our, our response to, to the principles of existence, to the order of being, and in line with human nature. You know, if we take, work it's just an effort it's just human action and um you know there was this um menga was i think um, the first to 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 say that property which is very often attacked property is the result of scarcity and not the cause of scarcity jean jacques rousseau he was trying to argue that um, property causes scarcity but it's the other way around. If we look at, there will, there will be a panel, I think the discussion or presentation by Professor Balcerovic on property. Um, I'm, I'm, I think uh, he'll touch upon some of those things. And then if we take profit, which is demonized, which is penalized by windfall taxes and, and you know, is treated as a source of social harm. If you look at it, profit is, 
just this principle of multiplication, which is encoded in nature. It's encoded in us. And financial profit, just one, like one form, one type of uh, multiplication that we have. You know, when doctors work, they want more health for their patients. When, when the policemen work, they want more safety in their communities. You know, when um, um, some of the examples I, I like, when, when educators teach, they want greater knowledge. So it's always more. It's always economizing, but also producing more. That's how we sustain ourselves. And with, with entrepreneurs, with financial profits, it's the same. It's just this principle of, of multiplication. So, and then, of course, in all of this, there is an acting moral agent. That's where freedom and morality comes in. So I think we need to really speak about the origins of economic institutions. And people, we act. So we, it just we, it resonates with us. Can I jump in on this very quickly? Because I think there's a key that the de-ideologize de uh, uh, economics. Start with number theory. Kids learn one and one is two, not 11, right? That's not ideological. And I think that explaining costs and trade-offs in this context. So I do think schools ought to be doing basic financial literacy. They used to. When I was a boy, you had to learn how to write a check. No one has seen a check in years. But uh, you had to understand you had to balance your checkbook. I don't remember how old I was when I... Uh, was taught this, and that was pretty helpful. But it's not theory, it's just numbers. And getting at that level, I think, can uh, help people to understand magic doesn't work. You can't conjure up more in your bank account than you saved to put into it. And so that's why I think, and I'll mention what Enos has done. You have a great track record of fighting this uh, populism in Slovakia in a clever way. The, the price of the state program, I don't know if that's still going. Sometimes these things run and then they fizzle out, but it was wonderful. It showed you had the opportunity to say, what state would you like to buy? And you got to then check out and you said, I'm willing to spend this much on sports stadiums and this much on education, this much on defense. He said, now, congratulations, here's the state you got. And it's huge. It's much bigger than the one you are willing to buy. That was a nice way to, to put it clearly to people. He did videos that were so funny and so clever. And they did it in such a way that they didn't... Uh, say who produced it. They were just put out, everyone's saying, who made this funny video? And they really did a great job of mocking idiotic populist measures. I think the one about everyone should have a dog was very clever and funny. So these things that start with basic number theory and then build out on that and show this magic doesn't work. And I think that's a way that we can go without having to start by revamping the whole curriculum start with the real basics, numbers and financial literacy, and then public education campaigns that build on that. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, of course, not everybody should have a dog. Every dog should have the appropriate human, uh, as we all know. Uh, so so uh, thanks for this intervention. It seems that we slightly uh, disagree on some uh, matters about the extent uh, what uh, uh, economic teaching and also what should be taught, the content or so. So I'm looking forward to what you will say, Mr. Noah. Um, I'm so tempted to address the magical thinking issue, but I understand the question is different. Uh, maybe we'll have some time to uh, to go back to to this. To this Say course. what you want <laughs> briefly, but no, no, no. I, I will try to. I will try to be brief. Uh, all right. Um, uh, has the educational system failed? Well, there is in the in the e-retail, there is a uh, there is an issue of a last mile. You can produce the merchandise, you can advertise the merchandise, you can uh, transfer it from the factory <coughs> to, 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 uh, to, to, to the place when it will be distributed. But in fact, for the customer, this last mile, when he receives the merchandise, creates his um, um, impression of this, whole, of this whole service. And it is quite similar with the education. Um, 
Why is that? Because we provide those people with the programs. I mean, the young um, people peoples we educate. We provide them with knowledge, but we are lacking the last mile. What is the last mile in this educational process? Well, um, the thinking has a tremendous future, and we are not teaching them to use that knowledge. We give them examples, we give them um, theories, but that's it. Do whatever you want with that. And this is the moment when the magic comes in. Because if something is quite complicated and we are not prepared to cope with that, we, our brain, is looking for the most straight way, the shortcut. And the shortcut using a magical uh, thinking is so easy. The magic solves every problem. You, you, you just appear. And uh, one thing more, uh, because we observed that in Poland, that this um, magical thinking, it is not bound to any social group. It is not bound to uh, education level, the IQ even. The most important factor influencing this uh, desire for magical thinking is lack of control. I mean, if you are lacking the control over your reality, no, not only self-control, the control of the reality, if you cannot influence the world outside your flat, your family, you are exposed to those communicates of magical thinking. The wizards just spot you and say, well, that's our prey. And that's what they do. And uh, th we, okay, we can be easily approached by these, these methods, never mind the whole process of preparation of, no, uh, of knowledge that was passed, uh, that, that was passed uh, uh, to us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, metric thinking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe just to return a little bit to what has been said about the ideology, the ideologizing um, the schools. Um, I'm a bit torn here because, on the one hand, I really like the idea of not having any value propaganda and really um, just focusing on the uh, on the economics. The problem is that. Um, what I see in Slovakia is that because of the communist heritage that there still is, um, teachers in the schools are scared to put forward any values. What happens is that um, I think we, we even have that in our constitutions that uh, schools should be, should be apolitical. But how the teachers and the school system interprets this is that anything remotely related to what political parties do, and this includes, of course, some value propositions, they stay away from it. And I'm not really sure that's the way to go, because I personally don't think that values such as freedom and liberty and things like that, which are, ideolog are ideological in a sense, I still think we should not be afraid to to really try to uh, to uh, to push them forward. So that's that's one thing. Uh, the second thing now to the question whether schools have failed. Um, maybe to put a number on it, um, we analyzed the results of the first round of the economics Olympiad in Slovakia, and just for your information, it's for high schoolers, right? And the questions aren't that difficult. It's about like. Um, which measures are good to tackle inflation, or like what would have, what would, ha what will happen if we open ourselves up to other markets? Um, the average success rate is 45 percent. So, like of all the questions, only 45 percent uh, get get the correct answer. So, apparently, there is a problem. Now, I am a bit reluctant to really put it on the school system. Uh, oh no, to put it on the schools specifically because they are, to a large extent, controlled um, by the state, right? The, the state dictates what should be taught, um, very often even what books should be used for it. Um, I have also anecdotal evidence. My mom is a teacher, and I saw it firsthand that 
she really has to prepare every single lesson based on what the state um, thinks is uh, is the best way to do this. Um, so I I must say that I really like the idea of opening up um, the school system in a way to really create a market of ideas um, in the schools. And yes, of course, there will be some collateral damage, let's say, um, in, the f uh, in the form of schools that will be teaching stuff that maybe we as liberals don't necessarily agree with. But I think that every other mechanism or every other strategy contradicts liberal thinking in itself. So, yeah. Can I, but, yeah, okay. Can I offer ahead, a compromise? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> uh, I, I think for the whole ideological question, if I can offer kind of a solution that may make us happy uh, around the table. Uh, when it comes to primary school, I totally agree with you, Anatta. I think it's possible to teach the basic foundations of economic theory in a totally non-ideological manner. You know, price mechanisms, trade-offs, all of that. I think that can be non-ideological. Later on, when people have more kind of experience with politics. Some people may be part of youth movements in their high school years and may have a lot more ideological ideas. Mm -hmm. Then I think it's very important to have these type of debates. Then, you know, you do you want more redistribution through the state or not? Do you want government ownership of the means of production? Do you want a more open society that's willing to take uh, immigrants in? These kind of questions that have a massive impact on the economic performance of a country. I think we can debate them in an intelligent manner later on in life. Can I also add, Please. I'm all for um, value-based education, but that's where we combine economics and ethics. That Because we talk about active moral agents. We talk about agency. And maybe our problem in the movement is that we talk about freedom as a value, because with values, you can either reject or accept. It's up to you. That's what, what values are for. I am for this value, you are for that value. But if we talk about freedom as our agency, because we have agency, we make trade-offs, we act, we compare, weigh, we do it every step we take. If we talk about freedom as, our, as something intrinsic to us, to our human nature, then it just reverses the whole perspective on things. Then it, it just put in a different light. And when it comes to whether we want a bigger government or not, it's all about our agency, whether we exercise our agency or we just keep it dormant and the government does things for us. And by the way, it's a great idea to give people those like bills from the state um, and show, okay, if you want more services, then you pay a higher bill. But the problem now, I just looked at Eurobarometer surveys the problem is that people do want, yes, they do want more services from the state, health, housing, childcare, you name it. And they are ready to pay higher taxes. That's what the surveys show. This is the problem. So this is about our agency and about, about our freedom. So let's talk about freedom as something inherent to our nature, intrinsic to us. And do we want to give it up? to give up our human nature and the way we respond to um, our human condition, basically. That's a quick, yeah, quick please. Please. My suspicion, but we, there's some way to, to go to our marketing friends to find out, is most people don't know how much they already pay in tax. That's true. And so what they want is for other people to pay higher taxes for all these services, which is kind of understandable. Um, so I think part of our project is explaining what is the real burden they face. So most people don't know what they pay in VAT, right? They don't know what the VAT on petrol is. They have some sense it's higher price in Europe than it is in, in America, but that's it. And explaining how high it is, I think, is quite powerful. So in Brazil, our friends there did a series of uh, programs on O Globo television, very funny. Again, funny is important, in which someone starts, a lady's filling up the uh, tank in her, her car, 
And along comes a tax collector, a gentleman in a black suit, and he just takes it and fills up his gas tank with it and then puts it up and she says, what's happening? And then it shows they're paying 60% tax on petrol. No one knew that in Brazil. As our friends did public opinion polling, the average Brazilian, when asked how much tax you pay, said, I don't pay taxes. <laughs> Rich people pay, pay taxes, but they do. So I think that's really important is to make it clear, what are you really paying? And uh, one last point, just a little dig at, at Adam, whom I admire so much. But you set up a 70-year strategy. Milton Friedman proposed uh, school vouchers in 1960. We're now getting them in 2023. So 63 years later, we're getting this a little bit of school choice. And I don't think we have 63 years given this uh, re-emerging uh, threat in Europe. Seems to be uh, quite more difficult than I thought. Uh, to, I thought there might, might be more harmony among us, but there seemed to be some difference about neutrality and ideology. Harmony is boring. Which is, which is, which is, which is uh, I know it's a complex system, neutrality and ideology, because everything that's neutral is, somebody will suspect it's still ideology. Uh, as we know now, you have feminist uh, chemistry or, or mathematics or something like this. But uh, you wanted to comment it as well? Uh, yeah, just uh, just a few sentences. Um, <clears throat> I would like to propose a, a solution. May I? You're right. Um, <clears throat> I think we should give up spending money on teaching people's economy. We just should let them, when they are adult, pay their taxes, but not through the entrepreneurs. Uh, in 15 minutes, there is a lecture of uh, Leszek Balcerowicz. He introduced a substantial change in Polish uh, tax system. He put the duty of fulfilling the old taxes, uh, um, uh, papers, uh, old paperwork, and transferring money to the state on entrepreneurs. So the employees, they got their, uh, their salary, and that's it. Maybe they heard about netto, brutto uh, salary, but that's it. If we let them pay those taxes monthly, even without the papers, even without the paperwork, I think that we'll experience a huge liberal change. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's the same system like we have, uh, okay, it's then rather fees, uh, the private and public insurance system in, in Germany, the state one is they pay everything for you and you don't see it. Uh, and the private one, except the very big bills from hospitals, you first have to pay and get it refunded. Then you have suddenly an idea how costly you are when you go to the doctor. <laughs> so it so, uh, might be really uh, a, a good idea. We have some 10 minutes left. And uh, it's time for some self-advertisement advertising here. Uh, uh, you suggested some things already, but uh, uh, we are here all representatives of NGOs or think tanks, and uh, we know that uh, the world outside, uh, our schools, our educational system, our universities are far from perfect and not fulfilling the ideal, neither the ideal of being pluralistic or being liberal, whatever we talk, we're talking about, usually it doesn't really work. but. It's our task to influence public opinion, to influence policies, to influence institutions. So what can NGOs, think tanks of our kind do to improve the teaching of economics in schools? Simply begin. I'm going to be like a politician and answer the questions I want to hear, not what I've heard. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to address Tom's question and criticism that I was too long-term oriented and say what we could do in the short term, medium term, and long term. And what we could do in the short term is very much what a lot of our member think tanks are already doing, I think, do the work ourselves. Besides the educational system, organize a lot of student conferences, seminars, internships, discussions and kind of the community building for students that a lot of the think tanks um, in, in this conference are already engaged with. Um, the problem is that we can only reach a pretty limited number of individuals through that, right? We don't have unlimited budgets, we don't have unlimited time, so it's only going to be a small, small fraction of the society that we're going to reach, but I think in the short term that really does make a difference. 
in the medium term, I think some think tanks are already doing that. So I'm going to let Aneta talk about the LFMI's work on, on this front. But essentially, try to engage with the teachers and help the teachers through contributing uh, to the curriculum um, with our own books to provide speakers. What, what um, my colleagues in the UK are doing, for example, is to provide a speaker from the Institute of Economic Affairs uh, for every student in the country that's studying economics. I think that's almost 100,000 people. Um, so they go there, they give um, a couple of talks, and they kind of present it in a pretty non-ideological way what free markets and, and what um, classical liberalism is about. I think through that, we can already reach a higher number of people. But I don't think we can forget about the long term. I think the school reform is very important. I think focusing on the voucher system and kind of this pluralistic educational system is very important. So I hope that there is going to be some think tanks who work on the long term reforms as well, because the short and medium term is only going to get us so far. Okay, Aneta, I know how much you are doing, so I have to warn you, keep it brief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on, on, on school choice, at least on school choice in the, within the state system, we did nail this reform in Lithuania back in 2008, starting with, with higher education and then with uh, secondary schools. Um, so it's possible, it's doable. Um, uh, on economic education, probably we are lucky in Lithuania that we have this very like, sound system of getting textbooks into schools. Like ourselves as an independent, non-partisan, private think tank, we can produce a textbook, get independent reviews, get official approval and get those books into schools. So now we have three textbooks in schools in Lithuania. Economics, later on we did interdisciplinary economics, civics, ethics, which basically puts the acting moral agent at the center of everything. And then the kids say, so we cover topics like work, you know, enterprise, like poverty, equality, and kids say no one has ever talked to us about those things. Um, so we are lucky in this way, in, in this sense, and we just, this September, a new, brand new textbook uh, went into schools for early teenage learners um, from us. But we also do um, integrate tools like personal tax calculators, uh, which give you your personal tax freedom day, your personal bill from the government. You can simulate and see whether you really want to have more uh, health care, child care, housing from the state or not. And one other thing we do um, is the national economic exam. It's for the whole nation. And we have this fantastic motto behind this exam, which, which says, behind every number, there is a human being. It sounds more elegant in Lithuanian, just three words. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's how we convey the idea that it, it's not just financial literacy, it's not just financial uh, economic education. Maybe that's the problem that it's, it's, we talk about finances, finance, it's not just finances, um, it's human action. So it's just a snapshot of our work, but um, maybe we are just lucky because we are in Lithuania. I like the good old days when we had Two and a half hours, time, uh, one and a half hour time uh, for a panel. Uh, it's all it's such a topic. Uh, okay, so we could discuss it for hours. Uh, we have less than five minutes, so yeah, yes, we have a kind of a clock here showing yeah. us, uh, yeah, counting down to deadline. Uh, all right, um, um, I'll go back to the research we have conducted with the um, head school headmasters, and um, one of the topics was the supporting of their educational effort in, in, in the area of economic economics and uh, that's what they said is they are so open for any cooperation the cooperation they are lacking they seek for different opportunities to <clears throat> to enrich those uh, those lessons and there are in in Poland there are such uh, such programs for example one of the private banks and one of the consultancy uh, companies, uh, thanks to COVID, because it has uh, uh, made the online uh, lessons quite easier, they are putting CEO 
of the National Bank, the CEO of this consultancy um, company, and make them explain quite complicated things in quite easy way. And these are for primary uh, school tu uh, students. Um, and the evaluation of the facts gives us an information that it works. So there is a huge, uh, huge desire for such, uh, for such um, measures. Thank you. Thank you. So well, how can we convince people that they th thought only that they had a free lunch, but didn't? <laughs> I'll be very short. One, I'm all for school pluralism. It's just not the answer to this problem, in my opinion. It's a diversion. But then the second thing is, our big problem is visualization of the cost. We think about the long term. That's characteristic of liberalism in general. How do you get people to think about the long term? It's hard. One way is to show them their grandchildren. It turns out that uh, older population who want bigger transfer payments switch their views when you explain the impact on their grandchildren. There will be no pension for them if we do this. And so I think how to visualize the future is a big challenge for us. And I think, Ines, really, in the past, you've done a good job. You have to do better in future, given the challenges. And then finally, humor. Be funny. And that's a problem. Liberals are not funny overall. We're boring on, and Tom, tedious. You're on yourself. We talk about we talk about numbers and long term boring. So be funny and to get people to pay attention. Uh, terrible for me, a German and a liberal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I totally agree with everything that has been said. So I'll just try to add two more dimensions to this. Um, the first one is that, sure, numbers are, of course, boring for many people, but they can also help to illustrate the scope of the problem. Każdy wybór ma swoje konsekwencje. Dziś na kazaniu o takich jak ty mówili, że to morderczynie. A wiesz, że ta, która ci pomogła, trafi za kraty? Trzeba mieć sumienie. Jak mogłaś to zrobić własnej matce? Aborcja to najgorsza zbrodnia. Gdybym ja podjęła taką decyzję, nie byłoby cię tu. 